Hello. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? Hear you? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Just barely. Let me try something over here. This seems better. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing okay. I got a thing that says this is recording. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. Just turn it so it's not recording. Okay. okay. See a couple other people trying to get on. We're still still a little early though. Hello. Beautiful Steve Dixon attached to this phone call. He is. How you doing, Steve? It's Michael. Hey, Michael. I'm doing absolutely great. It's good to see you. It's um, better to be seen. I can assure you. I've got video. I've got video switched off because Bonnie and I are actually eating dinner late, and we didn't want you guys to see us stuff in our faces. But uh, are you clothed? Or me? Are you clothed? Oh, you're dressed. You have pants on. Um, oh yes, we're clothed. Yes, but but we're in the process of, of 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 eating, and so when we get done with dinner, we'll maybe we'll turn the video on. But definitely looking forward to this. You know, after my stroke this summer, I pulled my office to the house. What a mistake! I can't find anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and of course, we've all been working from the house. Um, fortunately, we're able to do it. But anyway, anyway, it's just really good to see you. Thank you. Feels good to be seen. All right. Um, I guess they're going to, well, this is going to get started in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and mute my, mute this so you don't hear us chewing. And uh, we'll be on a listening and then um, join back in when we get done eating. Okay. Looking forward to it. Great. Okay, my name is on Zoom. Oh, and my picture is going to be showing there. Well, if you're in the camera, uh, wow. yeah, here I am. Oh, uh, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Alan Bedman uh, for the great work he's been doing in coordinating uh, the webinars. Uh, we have another one this week on the ADL, and uh, we have three or four, I believe, next week and, and beyond. Uh, on different topics. Um, first of all, I want to say FJMC has been working really hard on developing this Imagine a Life, the Mental Wellness Initiative. Uh, May is Mental Health Month, and to one of our collaborating partners is the Blue Dove Foundation. So I encourage you to go to their website. And our other partner right now is the Teshuva Center. So our ultimate goal with this uh, initiative is to destigmatize mental illness in our synagogues, to be able to have more open conversations um, and creating a plan for awareness, education, and prevention in, their, in our kids and their families. Uh, more open conversations in our synagogues. Tonight, Rabbi Eggie and I will speak mostly on the emotional effects of the post-coronavirus and how it will affect our lives. Um, being prepared is critical. Now, not just being prepared now for these pandemics, but possibly what's coming in the future. And, I, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more. We've mo many of us have saved for our retirements. 
Will we be able to enjoy it? Our futures have been threatened. How will the, this affect our mental health? Have our lifelong dreams possibly been shattered? Especially since we can't do a lot of traveling, how's that gonna affect the long term? Your input is gonna be welcomed. I'll get into that a little bit more. My recent passion, the reason I'm doing this, has been studying and researching the effects of post-coronavirus on our emotional, physical, and financial futures and what the new normal might look like. And that's gonna affect all of us. I believe that being prepared for the future is critical for both for us, but more importantly, for our children and our grandchildren. Their futures right now are being threatened. Because of the extensive amount of information in, 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 in this topic, um, we're just gonna restrict tonight to the emotional impact. And then on, March, on May 21st, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about the physical and the financial effects, and that's gonna be fairly extensive. Um, I would like to introduce Rabbi Iggy from the Teshuva Center. The Teshuva Center is a residential Jewish recovery home and community for addicts of all kinds. Coronavirus has exponentially increased the numbers of people needing help. The center has been instrumental in helping many Jews through several forms of mental illness. And we will discuss the post-coronavirus effects tonight. I did send out a few documents that you should have. Um, if there are questions, either raise your hand or put uh, or write a note at the bottom and Alan will take care of it. We're gonna talk for about 20 minutes. If you wanna talk in between, that's fine, but we'll leave the rest of the time for discussion. Now, I want to. So, Rabbi Iggy is initially going to speak on uh, where do we stand with mental illness as a result of coronavirus, and what are the intermediate and long-term effects on our mental health. Rabbi, uh, thank you, thank you for for having me. Some of you I've met before, some of you have not, um, and and thank you for. Um, really spending the time to um, to really talk about this, not just because it's affecting us, but because of what Gary just said, sort of the, the long term effect of this and how it's going to to impact us. I guess first I would say that sort of that unfortunately this will just prolong and increase something that's already been happening within the Jewish community, something that's already been happening all around even before. Uh, before this pandemic started, which is um, in many ways the reason why we need right sort of mental health awareness month is because we are not as a community i 'm sure a lot of individuals do, but as a community we 're not ready to face it we 're not really ready and open to talk openly about um, about addiction, about mental pain about spiritual pain, about all the things we're going through, right? So one of the things that sort of where we're doing, I'm actually recording my podcast tomorrow, and it's basically, uh, it's sort of a new hashtag, and that is sort of breaking the Shonda. That is, we have so many people who just refuse to admit, refuse to talk, refuse to share the fact that so many of us are in emotional pain. Um, you. Um, one of the one of the things. I don't know. Somebody has an echo. There we go. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the things is sort of that Gary and I started to talk about, and in general, and also Dr. Mandela, I've been talking about for for a while, is the place where we are now for a lot of people. Um, and, and this is where this is, gets a little bit interesting in terms of the work that we do. The isolation, the anxiety, the fear, the unknown, all those things that so many people are feeling right now. And they're feeling it across the globe, from New York to Boston to Chicago to Buenos Aires to Paris to Tel Aviv. The feelings of being unable to help oneself, feeling that they're that we're isolated, that we can't do the things that connect us, that we can't give hugs, that we can't see our children or grandchildren or partners, that feeling of um, not being able to express oneself and the feeling of isolation and anxiety and perhaps high stress 
in many ways, a lot of us are feeling what addicts and people with mental illness are feeling all the time, 365 days a year. And, and it should be an illustration for us to, to, to really think about what does it mean to actually feel and be part of, of, of a mental health issue. What we're facing right now is ginormous. I, I don't have the, the numbers specifically because they need to be vetted, but I was talking to people today within, uh, within the uh, New York uh, health system, within uh, health and hospitals. And unsurprisingly, but very accurately, they're finding increased numbers in the uh, uh, mental health psychology, psychiatry of people. There's an increase, which is not surprising. What is surprising is the increase is people with no prior mental health problems. The mental health problems that are arising from this pandemic, from coronavirus, from the isolation, from this inability to deal, that's what is happening already. And we're not even past it. That's what we're finding already in the hospitals in New York City. And that's a trend. People are dying. The increased amount of people that's happening in terms of um, overdosing, in terms of mental health issues, suicide, it's increasing. People are feeling the strain. And one of the things that's upon us is to make sure that we have a, a streamlined response, a way for us to open our spaces within our communities to say, you are welcome here. This is something we want to talk about. This is something we want to support. This is something we want to have a larger conversation about because, and I'll end with this, the way to support, yes, there's the whole medical field, but the way to support is a spiritual one. And it's something that we all know. I've said it once and I've said it before, I'm quoting Yohan Hari, the opposite of addiction. And in that sense, I would say the opposite of a lot of mental health is not recovery, it's not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And our ability to create spaces for people within our communities, within our homes, is crucial. And if it was before, if it was important and something we have to put a readiness, now it's gonna become absolutely crucial to make sure that the lives of our loved ones and our community members are saved. Thank you. Very nice. Um, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over a theory that I have uh, from studying this. Uh, I wrote it in our Passover service, and I want to uh, share it with you. And you can beat it up. You can um, look forward to it uh, and take take some information out of it and create your own ideas out of it. I related the ten plague, ten biblical plagues to what I call the 10 plagues of today. And we're still in the midst of those plagues. I feel that, um, that we don't have a time frame between the plagues of the biblical times. So it could have, the, each plague could have been five days apart, five years apart, a hundred years apart. So with that in mind, if we take what I call the plagues of today, we had the Spanish flu, I consider the Holocaust as a plague. We had Mars, we had SARS, we had MERS, we had um, we have uh, Ebola, and now we have coronavirus. These seem to be mutating in a very rapid pace compared to the past. Um, I really feel that Ebola was maybe were a worse potential plague than coronavirus is. We were just on top of the Ebola and we were prepared for the future. What happened with coronavirus leads me to believe that we are gonna have a significant number of more plagues sooner rather than later. And some of them could be holocaustic in nature. Why do I say that? Well, I have two theories on that. One. I think the world can't support the number of people that are in it without causing more issues and more problems. And the second reason I, I feel is 
that with global warming, we have mutations of bacteria and viruses that potentially are going to create significantly more problems, and we need to be prepared for it. How do we prepare for it? That's something that I'd like to discuss as we go along um, and we get a little bit later into this conversation. Um, before we go on to Rabbi Iggy's next piece, um, does anybody want to share any questions? Um, maybe Gary Cates wants to say something. Gary's on our Mental Wealth Wellness Committee and he is uh, one of our main professionals that are helping us through this. Gary? Thanks, Gary. So, um, Rob Egez, I want to just build on what you were talking about just a few minutes ago. Um, from a psychological perspective, we know that psychopathology and stress go hand in hand. The, the model that most psychologists use is something we call a diathesis stress model. And this builds also on what Gary Smith was talking about, how we're, we're heading into uh, an era where we're going to see likely a very rapid increase in the number of people that are affected, not only by mental health issues, but also by substance abuse issues. And this goes to, I think, the question that um, uh, Steve Mandel just posted that I typed, was typing an answer to. So the model of psychopathology that most clinical psycho psychologists use is diathesis stress. Diathesis is something we inherit, something that our genes have. And everyone has a predisposition to a large number of different things. Once your individual stress level goes above what your diathesis is, that can trigger the mental health issues that we're talking about. So you put that model, which has been around for decades, in, in the environment of a global pandemic, and it's, it's a no-brainer, as Rabbi Iggy was saying, that we are going to see much more David, are you there? cases of, of uh, psychopathology and, and a wide range of different types um, as a result of this. So, um, you know, that, that would be, that, that's, that, that's something I would, I would add to that, Gary. Thank you. That was great. What, Steve? Buddy K, you had a question? Not really a question. It's something, it's something I, I, that this has kind of provoked uh, a thought that I have that I wanted to share. My name is Lenny Canterman. I'm a friend of Gary Smith's in Cincinnati and I'm a retired physician. Um, and I heard something on the news the other day that I heard that I felt was very disturbing. And they talked about something. I pushed the wrong it, button. But you look good. Did you get a haircut? Nicole. Um, uh -huh. They talked about a concept that I found somewhat disturbing. They talked, it was, they called it, we can now expect a rise in what they're calling the deaths of despair. We know that with prolonged unemployment and poor economic and financial conditions for many people in this country, that we expect an increase in mental health issues resulting in a certain number of suicides and of deaths from substance abuse and alcohol abuse. Um, and what I have sensed in, in hearing people's response to this, you almost get a dichotomy that, well, if you get coronavirus and you get respiratory <laughs> failure and you die in a respirator from respiratory failure, well, it's not your fault, but if you, allow yourself to get depressed or overwhelmed or turn to substance abuse or depression and suicide, somehow those deaths, you know, don't mean as much, don't count. We, we you know, and, and I think part of the issue is, the rabbi was kind of talking about this. I think there's a, there's a, a tendency towards insensitivity within our society to people that struggle with these very real problems. The sense that somehow depression is somebody's own fault. I think the people that have never suffered from depression or serious mental health issues, their attitude is, well, what's wrong with these people? Why can't they just pick themselves up by their bootstraps and make themselves better? And the, the answer is they can't. So I'm just curious what other people think about this um, concept. Right. Um, I'm, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Go ahead. I, I want to say, like, I, I would say that that is, um, that, that is 100% correct, right? Sort of like, we see this all the time with people that we work with, where people say like, well, just, you know, stop being so miserable or like, right. Or stop using drugs or like, you know, what's wrong here? Like you're married. What's wrong. Right. Cause it's not even those with, with financial deck, like, you know, how many clients have I seen people, how many people within our, within our families who grew up in nice Jewish families with nice Jewish education, who went to camp, who has a nice car, who have a college degree, who simply can't, right? And people say to them like, well, what's wrong? Like everything's right. And I think by the way, to answer a little bit, uh, starting to the answer what Steve was saying before is that we're gonna find 
let's say that they, you know, that sort of, right, they start easing and it's getting better in the summer or whatever. We're going to find a whole bunch of people who still don't want to go out of the house, who still don't want to hug, who don't want to shake their hands, who don't want to go to the office, who are afraid. And we'll have people say to them, like, what's wrong? Everything's great now. It's, it's, it's okay. You know, come out, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll shame them as well into things. And people will start feeling that they can't say, like, no, I just spent six months being afraid for my life. I just spent, right? And how many grandparents will be hesitating the first time the grandchildren, right, are sneezing? Right? How many times, right, somebody's going to sneeze behind you in, like, right, in a line and you're going to freak out? And we're going to be like, what's wrong with you? We cannot allow, right, so for, for, for the circumstances of life to continue to dictate what happens with us inside. And by the way, and I think this is one of the interesting opportunities of this, of this plague, is that every single person has now went through anxiety and stress and somewhat depression. Whether you are living in Boca or the or Fifth Avenue or whether you are on Skid Row, you felt those same things. And we have to use that and to remind people, like, remember when you felt you couldn't leave the house? Remember the panic that you had going to a grocery store? Remember that? That's how we feel. That's how everybody feels. And we have to raise the awareness and, and, and stand up at shul at places and be like, yeah, me too. And it's okay. Right? I too, Rabbi Iggy, right? We're the thing and a congregation and everything. I too have felt those things and I'm afraid in the next thing. And to allow people to be like, hey, that, yes, you know what? I, I didn't know that I was, the, I, was, I was also. And in terms of the signs, I think that we have to be a lot more soft with each other and with others about what it means to have a strong emotional, psychological, spiritual core, right? So I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> I'm a rabbi, right? So I can talk about building a, psycho, a, a, a spiritual core, one that will help you through these things. I, I, I have to tell you that sort of, right, there's a lot of stuff that sort of I feel very lucky because in many ways I've trained for years for, right, this thing. I keep talking about to clients and to people about building a spiritual bank account right? Gary, you said that next time you'll talk about financials, right? But so you have to write, you have to build a spirit, right? You have to build a bank account, you have to provide your 401, you get right So all these things to make sure that you can retire. But what about your spiritual bank account? Because if you don't fill your spiritual bank account, here you are, now coronavirus, they, I don't know, 5,622, and you have to write a big check. And if you don't have spiritual money in your account, you're going to overdraft. And you're going to go bankrupt and you're going to start seeing a lot of erosion of the self. Do I matter? My life? What am I going to do? Stress, anxiety, right? We're talking, right? This, this, this people, one of the things we're seeing at the hospitals, and the only reason I know a lot of this is, you'll excuse me, but my partner runs the health system, the, the healthcare system in New York. So it's all we talk about, right? Um, we, right, we talk, there's enormous amounts of people who are complaining about, um, uh, nausea and stomach issues and right and, and right and dr katz i'm sure right so you you will say right so like that like right that is not just like the virus prolonged stress and anxiety will give you enormous amounts of that yes right but how many times we'll say like oh whatever it's fine you know eat a cracker <laughs> right my jewish mother eat something <laughs> my point being is they think that sort of this is both frightening right? I have kids and all that. It's frightening of what's going on, but it's also opportunity for us to see like, you know, we're all in this together. There's a great human condition lesson in this plague. All of us are going through this and it is up to us, the people in this call to raise the flag and say like, let's talk about this. Let's bring the awareness because that's what's going to help us being through this together. Great. Um, Gary, can you, uh, explain vicarious trauma syndrome? <laughs> uh, I, I saw that. I was hoping that that, was, that question was going to Rabbi Iggy, but, but I, let, I, I, I'll circle back <laughs> Sorry, like, that's, that's squarely <laughs> under you. Like, you know. <laughs> let, 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 me, um, let, let me just pick up on something Rabbi Iggy said that I thought was, was, was really fascinating. 
Um, well, that's a bad introduction. I think a lot, everything you've said so far is really fascinating. <laughs> I get it, I get it. The it. resonated yeah. with me is there was a paper that came out, gosh, about 10, 15 years ago. There are a bunch of uh, GI docs, I think they're in New York, and they looked at consecutive admissions to the ER, pediatric ER, for undifferentiated belly pain, right? Two thirds of them had no medical explanation, right? So most of the time, then, so where did the belly pain come from? Well, it came from stress, anxiety, and what have you, and so forth. Um, vicarious trauma that uh, that uh, Steve Mandel was talking about. It's not a term that that I typically use. Um, my my sense from what I, I think Steve is is describing is when we're all in this together, as Rabbi Egi, as you were talking about a few minutes ago, um, you, we get triggered by what other people do. As, as Rabbi Egi was saying before, you know, we're social beings, we, we connect, whether we're Jews or not. We, human beings like to connect to folks. We, we pick up signals from other people. You kind of know if someone off in the distance is, is a good to approach or not good to approach, that whole approach avoidance system we have going in our brains. And, and vicarious trauma likely is that we see someone else that's in pain. We see someone else that's, 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 that's hurting. And the empathy in us, which is good, feels or understands that pain. The sympathy in us, which is also still good, but maybe not as good as empathy if you're a clinician, feels that pain with them. And vicarious trauma is sort of feeling the pain that other people are feeling, even though you may not be experiencing the same type of trauma that that person is experiencing themselves. It's like when you watch um, or you hear stories of, of, of what Robbie was talking about, people dying in hospitals alone, right? That's traumatizing, obviously, for that person in the hospital. But when you think about that and you project and put yourself, God forbid, a million times in that situation, that's traumatizing for you, even though thank God, there but for the grace of God, go, all right, you're not in that situation. Steve, I hope that covers, I think, what, what you were asking about. If not, I have, then I'd love to hear from you. I have a question. So, so Holocaust, for example, Holocaust, that's like a vicarious trauma, right? Stuff that's sort of like we didn't experience ourselves, but like we, we learned throughout the culture of what the trauma is. When, when, so I remember the first time I saw um, Schindler's List. Right. Right. You walk out of that movie, right? And if you're not traumatized, right. then then there's another issue we need to talk about, right? <laughs> that, that's that's vicarious trauma. You know, Gary said something that, that kind of resonated with me a little bit and it's something we've been seeing, I think, very little of, and that is how much stress there is on the healthcare providers, on the doctors and nurses who are working so hard to try to take care of people. And in so many cases, it's futile. You know, I mean, you've been hearing stories about doctors and nurses say, I haven't seen this many people die in a year. And I saw more people die in a week than I, saw, than I usually see die in a year. That is horribly traumatic. And one of the things that I've said actually from the very beginning of this, you know, they were talking about, we're gonna have a shortage of ventilators. We're gonna have a shortage of hospital beds. I wasn't worried about those shortages at all. What I was concerned about was a shortage of human capital. We're gonna run it at people. We're gonna run it at doctors and nurses. You know, doctors and nurses can't work 12 hours a day, six and seven days a week, that hard under that intense conditions without getting burned out. Never mind getting sick physically, but just getting burned out emotionally. I wonder, have you been seeing that? Any anybody working in the healthcare field? How how are the professionals dealing with this? Absolutely. I mean, again, I, I'm thinking about here in New York, that is the main concern. The main concern is the burnout. The main concern, right? There's a lot of facility, but the concern of people. <coughs> and, and also, the again, the spiritual burnout, right? The spiritual burnout things. In fact, so like, and I don't know if anybody thinks, but one of the things that we've created for the Chuba Center is a, a class, a virtual uh, uh, workshop that is directed at caretakers to see how they can recharge their spiritual <coughs> backgrounds so that they can get feel that they're cared for. Because right, they are really sort of uh, uh, depleting everything. I can say for myself, right, the comment, the, the calls I get, the people I talk to, right, the things that we see all the time, right, it, it's, if you don't have a spiritual practice, if you don't able to, to actually do something about it, it is completely and utterly depleting. And at some point also it is demoralizing because you're like, right, I spoke with five people. What's five people in New York? Like, right, so like it, you just can't see. And in fact, but right, if, you, 
if you read, and I know people like, again, I only know New York, but like in the Times, right, there was an, uh, an EMT who killed himself. There was a, 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 an, an ER, ER doctor. An ER doctor, ER doctor, nurse. Yeah. And if you read about it, right, that, again, talk about post-corona, you will have a whole generation of doctors, right? We have doctors saying in the ER, saying, I didn't sign up for this. And we're like, no, no, that's exactly what you signed up for. <laughs> but apart, right? But in that sense, right, this sense of like, right, this eroded sense that like we weren't, we didn't expect this in, within. This is America, right? This is right. This is 2020. People don't like dying masses on the street. We'll figure it out. And yet, things. And I think that's true for a lot. I think that's true for for financial planners. I think that'll be true for psychologists. I think that'll be true for doctors, for nurses, anybody who gives care. For rabbis, cantors, right? We, but part of the agenda is talking about children, like right, like the children who are cooped up in the apartment, right? The children, Have you brushed your teeth yet, honey? Right, the children who's been uh, canceled the summer camps, right? Like, and and not just that, right? Like uh, CSU in in California just decided to cancel their fall semester, right? I have a kid who's going to college, so his college didn't, didn't uh, but like, then what? So they're staying home again, more, doing what? Finding jobs? Yeah, good luck with that with 4 million people. On like, right, sort of, we're, we're facing something that will really challenge us as a community and not just financially, because it's, it's gonna challenge our sense of purpose. It's gonna challenge our sense of what am I supposed to do now? Who am I supposed to be, right? How can I, both right sort of entertain my children but also make sure that they're not like you know god forbid and frank in the house there's so many problems in our inability to even conceive of a lot of the mental health and it's going to hit us in the face and the only way to do it is to start the conversation now to open the channels to create the groups to talk to the rabbis right to sort of right again right so the the, the workshop that we're running for for caretakers to start Helping a conversation, right, and and making the space for people to say, all right, how can how can we find meaning in all this? Because that's what this is all about in the end, right? To, for us, ability to somehow to find meaning in our suffering. Mike Freilich. What I was thinking about was perhaps there was some type of a Jewish response to this that we could find in our literature. Perhaps from Maimonides, Egeret Taman, Letter to Taman, or something like that, that one of our scholars or rabbis might care to respond. Well, say the question again. Well, I thought there might be some type of a way to deal with this from our tradition, from some of our traditional sources. For example, uh, Egeret Taman might have a possible idea in it. I thought it was interesting the way our synagogues have changed and some of these changes will become permanent. I think the way we look at some of our, the way we do things will have to change through our religion and our recall to what we believe. Did, did anyone see uh, what, uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, things I put on the uh, website about the social security system? Did anybody take a look at that? Well, Apparently, the Social Security Administration had made a release and it showed that um, the, all the Social Security workers are working from home. Their efficiency has increased markedly. More people are getting service uh, and there's less stress on them coming to work. And that is probably going to be one of the new normals. I think it's going to have a large effect on a lot of corporations, on a lot of businesses. Um, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, we need to be aware about, uh, be aware of. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Twitter, by the way, just announced, Twitter announced that they will allow workers to work from home indefinitely forever. It's less expensive for them. That's right. For sure. Now, my concerns are post Corona is, is this going to have a market effect on relationship building, on hugging, which, yes. you know, I, I, I miss hugging my grandchildren. I miss hugging my, my children. 
uh, happens that one of my da my daughters is on the phone call tonight, so I'm very excited about that. Um, she's interested in this, uh, and I think it's really important uh, that that we have this. Uh, how's the political campaign going to run with uh, not shaking hands, being out there to the public? Um, this is just a microcosm of things that we're going to see. Um, the sports industry, how's that going to change in the next year or even permanently? Um, my nephew is a, owns a, not owns, he, he manages a hotel in Hawaii. And he said tourism's down 80% in Hawaii, and that's their almost their sole source of, uh, of revenue. Uh, he doesn't know if it's ever going to come back completely. They, they're talking six months to a year. So you're talking about huge numbers of jobs. Um, kids are staying closer to home. Uh, that's good, but what are the next steps? What's going to happen? Uh, online grocery stores, that's huge. Um, the suggestion is, is that online grocery stores are going to grow exponentially because you know, people are, after they do it the first or second or third time, they, they, that's all they want to do is shop online grocery stores, much like we're doing with uh, everything else online. Anybody want to weigh in on any of this? Um, I think so Steve, here's another thing uh, that I, the, oh. oh, Steve, sorry, go uh, ahead. Steve Mandel. Yeah, I have uh, two comments. Uh, one, um, in one of my synagogues, uh, Rabbi Iggy knows well, Rabbi Rachel Ain had a meeting for healthcare workers. She had a specific session, and during that session, brought out biblical prayers for healing, which I felt to be um, very helpful, and everybody felt for the healthcare workers, and maybe you could suggest to your rabbi that there are prayers, as someone brought up, that those prayers could be directed towards those on the front line, or healthcare workers, or to those families. Number two is, uh, Rabbi Iggy, can you address the idea that when you're treating or you have a family or someone with addiction that you don't plan for the future, but you live for that moment. You live for a day that there will be hope and not necessarily the plan is the kid going to go to Harvard, but you worry that, um, that you want to plan and not plan for them. Plan for yourself to enjoy the moment, um, just like we heard from Rabbi Cohn, that there'll be light one day, but at this time, enjoy where you are and enjoy life and don't think that you have to now make plans for the future. So I hear from Rabbi Yagi. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a couple of things. One was somebody was saying about the biblical things. To, to, to go back to what Gary says, we have to remember that after the plagues comes liberation and comes uh, revelation, right? After the plagues, right, we have 49 days. That's what we're going through now, the 49 gates of, of impurity, Right? And then we get to the moment of revelation. We get to moments of truth. So in that sense, our traditions are very clear about the roles of plagues. They're there to remind us right, that we have to go through these in order to learn something. And, and in that sense, right, for me, my job in that sense as a rabbi is to make sure that this, our suffering has meaning, that we're not just going to say, as soon as they say we have a vaccine, be like, oh, never mind, you know, it's over. Right, and that we really so sort of like, how do we learn? What do we learn from right from you know so many days at home for people things and and exactly as as you know Dr. Mandel says, we have to one of the ways again to to put spiritual money in your spiritual bank account is to focus on today, to focus on the things you can do today to be better, to not right to not future trip to not plan for others but to live for yourself and create what, right? What are the things that you create for yourself in terms of hope? What are the things you create for yourself in terms of, right? How do you, how do you check in with yourself? Are you journaling, you know, meditation, prayer? Are you doing prayer? Like I can share uh, before we leave, I, I can also put it in the chat. I wrote a prayer for these times. So I'll just share it in the chat, right? Sort of that we, that we say about this, right? That sort of that we, that we help ourselves uh, um, uh, I'm happy to read it too, if any, if we want uh, towards the end, right? Um, so, so I wrote a prayer for, for this for this time, so we can do this, right? There is a prayer um, that uh, Rabbi Noth wrote on, like on putting on the the mask, 
right? Sort of like, is it like you put a tzitzit or you put talent to fill in? So like, right, can you have a prayer thing? And again, the, the idea is to create meaning every day, not for the future, not in things, but right now, right? What can you be grateful for? What is your mindfulness? And our tradition is very clear about this. From the moderni in the morning to the shema in the evening to all the different things, right? Right, we talk about Birkat Amazon, right? Hamotzi lechem min haaret. When I was a kid, I used to say like Hamotzi lechem min hamakolet from the grocery store because that's where I thought bread came from. Until my grandfather was really annoyed and be like, no, 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 this kid is too urban. He needs to know where bread comes from, right? How are we focusing on a day-to-day, right, with people in our households who are addicts, right? One of the other things that's really disturbing, if you look at Instagram, social media, everybody seems to be flooding and tooting their day drinking. It's okay to have a martini at four, right? In a garden has a martini the size of a, you know, the size of a football. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I hate that word because it's so millennial, you'll forgive me, but it's so triggering constantly to be bombarded by trying to uh, um, dull, dull the senses of what this is, of what we're going through. And I want to say from a spiritual point of view, we can't, we can't afford it. We can't afford to dull the senses. We have to learn about our community. We have to hold about mental health. And, and I'll go back to the original point. Remember everything we felt, especially the beginning, or if you're right older and going out, the stress, the anxiety, imagine feeling like this, 365 days a year for years. Talk to any addict, talk to any mental illness. And that's the thing. Like, I feel stressed. I feel PTSD. I don't want to go out. I'm afraid of the hugs. I'm afraid of the people. I don't want to go do it next to a bar. Like that's how people feel all the time. And perhaps that's one of the things we, we, should, we, should, learn, we should learn from, right? Rabbi, have you been having people who are having theological kind of questions? Somebody talked about prayers and whatnot. It's kind of like, okay, this person gets coronavirus and has no symptoms or has minimal symptoms. And this person two days later is dead. And, you know, there are the occasional, you know, miracle stories. We have one in Cincinnati, a man who was sick in the hospital, seven weeks, came home. Okay. What did he do to entitle him to have such a good outcome? Well, so many other people have bad outcomes. Are people struggling with these kinds of issues? Yeah. And, and what do you tell them when you're struggling with these kinds of issues? A hundred percent. Um, Again, right? I can't speak for God, but what I can what what I can say is that we have to we have to see those questions. When somebody comes with a question, I have to say to them, we have to see this question separate from this really the small this really event. You can't all of a sudden, right? Like being faced with Corona, be like, oh, now I have this. To those like like what what are the questions we're asking before? What are the questions we're asking after? How is this? What is your theology, right? And if you come to God with a question, God will come back with a question for you, right? And and in that sense, right, to try and look do two things. One is to support people who are people who are hurting. I mean, that's what we're here. People are in pain, right? And, and, and no matter what I can tell them, right? I can't say like, oh, he died for this, he died for that, or he suffers for this, suffer. we can't. But what I can do is saying like, this is horrible. What you're going through is horrible, right? What you're feeling is right. What you're feeling is justified. Your anger, your resentment, all these are right. And the fear that attached them. What are we going to do with them? That is what the work that we could do together. So if you come to me as a rabbi, I'd be like, okay, now we can have a conversation. I can't solve it for you, but I can walk the path with you. And in many ways, that's what people need. Somebody, people to walk the path with them. To say, I'm not alone in this. I don't feel by myself in this because like, otherwise I just feel like a freak. And then I want to, and then and it feels weird. And then I don't want to feel weird. So I'll take a drink or I'll, I'll go shopping or like I'll ignore it or I'll squelch it, Right. <laughs> Right? I won't talk about it. Everything's great. How many people are like, oh, everything's great. How can everything be great? That's impossible. Not everything is great at the moment. It's pretty shitty. And let's talk about that. Right? And, and our inability to, our, or not ability to be like, our reluctance to connect, to say, hey, okay, I see you. Hey, man, you matter. Tell me really. Right? And like, oh, I'm so, it's so silly, but like, I'm worried about like my granddaughter giving me a hug. That's not silly at all, right? 
well, ma'am, maybe she doesn't, now she doesn't think I love her anymore. Like, no, like those are the real conversations and we have to have them. And we've been, have to, we, we've been needing to have them for quite some time. From the addict in the house, it's already cooped up, right? How many people I have who like can't go to meetings, right? Who like, you know, are in the house. And luckily, right, us too, we run meetings online and there's a lot of Zoom. But, but that too, like, right, how many now, like many of us, right, talk about mental health. Most of the day now I'm staring myself in the mirror, right? That has real significance, right? This is the, psychologically, I feel exhausted by it. I don't want to look at myself all day long, right? Constantly be like, ooh, look, line, ooh, things, oh, I'm too fat, oh, my hair, my, like right, this constant right, nitpicking at myself and, the, and, the, right, and, and what it does to us. And, and, and not to mention, of course, being alone in a small rooms with the family, everybody, right? Triggering people saying the wrong thing. Why can't you put the dishes the right place, right? All these things that are just like on and on and on. And it's mounting. And again, the only way to alleviate is to communicate and to try and find uh, an inner space of peace and an outer space of peace. To try and make sure that you, right, sort of, pray and meditate and clear your mind, but also to write and to reflect what are you going through to be able to communicate and to be able to say without any repercussion, like, I'm afraid. This is scary. I don't know what's going on. This is scary. Right? Um, adults and children. So while we're still working on other questions, uh, I want to uh, int introduce uh, two uh, illustrious uh, rabbis that we have, Ra Rabbi uh, Ruben, I didn't know if he wanted to say anything, and I'm, I'm excited that, that my rabbi is here, Rabbi Smolkin in, from Cincinnati. Um, I just wanted to introduce everybody to them, uh, if they have anything to say. Rabbi Smolkin, I know we've had several conversations, and he's very, very excited about this initiative. Does either rabbi want to say anything? First of all, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the work that uh, that we're doing, just coming together. I think that uh, Shema Yisrael, listen Israel, is such an important mitzvah. And uh, I apologize, I'm just kind of toggling right now. And this is part of part of what we're talking about, but toggling between uh, kind of coming from one meeting and then getting the kids ready for bed and putting pajamas on and brushing teeth. Um, and, uh, you know, there's one of them right there. But you know, the this, this sense of Shema uh, Yisrael, really listening to what everyone has going on. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've been hearing just from my uh, community is that people's experiences are, um, you know, so diverse in terms of what they have going on in their home. Because their home, uh, it's not, you know, often with, uh, let's say, the mezuzah, right? You know, and so you kiss the mezuzah, like have your in-space. And your out space and now in some ways you have your in space that is your out space right your office your work is with you know the same place at sometimes at the same time as you're putting the kids to bed um and and that for folks you know and for some folks you know their out space um is really how they're connecting with other people in their community um and their in space is literally just them right and what does that mean i mean everyone's situation, whether they're, you know, often the folks I'm speaking with, they're either uh, having tons of people around and they're kind of overwhelmed, overloaded, or maybe they're like, you know, they're, they're either, they're kind of starving for contact or they're overloaded from it. Um, and it's just every person, we just have to really listen and see like what's going on with each individual and try and support each individual with what they have going on. Um, and this week, what's been in my mind um, I started off the week with Matovu, Yisrael. How you know, Matovu? How good are your dwelling places? Uh, and thinking about again the the kedusha that we can bring, the holiness that we can bring within our homes, and how do we have that? Again, the, often the Shema and the Mezuzah is like the portal where we're inside or outside, and the idea of it's kedusha holiness isn't just out there in the world, but it's also inside as well. And how can we bring holiness to where we are in our current situation, right? Which is also something that Judaism is always trying to do. Because Oshim to you, y'all should be holy. Um, and 
sorry about the y'all, but that's what it says. It's from <laughs> Texas, you know? Um, and, uh, and so, you know, but that, that mitzvah to bring holiness into our environment, even if it's not the environment in the way that we would have chosen or something, but that mitzvah, how do we bring holiness and how do we lift up uh, in these times, I think is, uh, it's, kind of, it's tough and everyone has their individual experiences. And that's really one of the things that uh, coming on here and hearing from different people, um, I, I really appreciate so much hearing from everyone and what everyone shared thus far. So uh, I just want to open the floor back up, but thank you for, uh, for uh, going and opening this forum for us. Thank you. Thanks, Rabbi. That's the, the spiritual aspect I think uh, Rabbi Iggy was speaking about. And well put. Um, we are, our synagogue is going to start a series of these uh, webinars. Rabbi Rubin, would you like to say something? I just uh, really came and joined to listen to others. And I, uh, I think the sharing, obviously, on virtual uh, platforms is very important. And uh, so I appreciate everyone sharing their thoughts. And um, I think that's important reaching out to people who you would not necessarily connect with. And um, so I just wanted to listen in and learn what I could. Thank you. Um, so are anybody else have anything to add? Uh, uh, and I'll do a closing. Um, Gary? I have, you, I have just a quick comment um, on what Rav Egan was just saying, talking about dulling the senses and day drinking is something. Um, uh, so one thing that we know is uh, another, I, I love how Rabbi Iggy sets up these, 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 these opposites. I, I think the opposite of dulling the senses is mindfulness, right? And mindfulness has amazing antidepressant and anti-anxiolytic and anxiolytic effects as well. So, um, you know, if, if, if you want to talk to someone about engaging in simple mindfulness exercises, um, uh, Paul Davidson and I have done... Uh, a talk on coping with COVID. We've actually done it, redone a um, the, the beginning part of that, just lead HMV sessions, Gary. Uh, and that's going to be once Paul takes a listen to it, we're going to send it out for to the clubs to look at as well. Uh, the funny thing about that particular story in that particular uh, coping thing that includes some stuff on mindfulness in it. So my wife yesterday, ironically, was in sort of a little bit of a funk. And I was telling her, oh, well, you can do this, we can do this, and let's talk about this. And then, then it just dawned on me. I said, you know what? You should listen to Paul's talk that he and I, that, that we just did last night. Uh, and she kind of looks at me, and there's this long pause. This goes to what Rabbi Iggy was saying, and, and Rabbi um, I think, uh, Smolka was saying about the inside versus outside, right? So my wife looks at me and, and has this long pause and says, I don't think I can listen to you online for half an hour. I listen to you enough in the house. <laughs> so <laughs> just something to think about mindfulness but you need to know sort of where your limits are and with that I'll, I'll yield the floor back to you Gary okay yeah. uh did uh Michael Fralick have uh something he wanted to say or did Steve Mandel have something they wanted to say uh two things uh one um I asked Rabbi Iggy and the other clergy how they feel that as a group we can now educate the clergy um, to make people in the congregation more comfortable to approach them. And second, I just read Rabbi Iggy's poem, which I think um, he emphasizes the care for healthcare workers, but I think it's inspirational to me uh, being uh, doing what I do, as well as to every single person. So maybe you can read it because it really is wonderful. Thank you. Steve has been on the uh, on lines every day, works at uh, Lenox Hill, is that right? Correct. Lennox Hill, a pediatric neurologist, and uh, he's been instrumental in us getting this um, uh, mental wellness uh, initiative off the ground, and uh, we thank him immensely. Um, Michael Fralick, did you have something you wanted to say? Okay. Um, if no one else has anything else, I'm, I, I want to... Uh, suggests that a title of a book called Blue Dove uh, from the Blue Dove Foundation, it's called Quieting the Silence. It's an easy read. It's a really nice read. I've just started it though. Um, and it kind of goes both ways. Uh, this is read from uh, what Steve Dix asked me to say. It's not just the sufferers who need to be able to talk. It's those who are not, who need to learn how to listen instead of thinking there is silence. 
Steve, did you want to say anything about that? No, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just sort of, uh, the whole thing just went dead on me on my PC and I just had to log back in. So oh, I, that's I, okay. I just to say, I, I, but but what you, you were talking a little bit about the book? Yes. And the Blue, Blue Dog Foundation, yeah. It's, yes. And it's everything that we're talking about here um, on, on quieting the silence. The silence, this book is about people who have finally, who have suffered, who have found the courage to, to, to speak and no longer be silent. We, those of us who think that we're not suffering, also need to find a way to quiet our silence in, in, in being there for people who need help, who need support, just so that they know they've got somebody to talk to, not to be the therapist, but to know that they're not alone. And, and that is just uh, so much of, of what I think we're driving to do here. And if that's repetitious of what you've said, I, I apologize for that. No, nope, it's not. You always come up with something good. <laughs> um, next week, uh, we're going to talk about the okay, intersection. Gary? Yeah. Gary, I mean, before we think, because I would love to sort of read the prayer, but also to say just a, a, another couple of words if we have time. Oh, please do. Please do. Oh. So, so just a couple of words. One is uh, I, I also shared, because one of the questions of Steve was like, what can we do to our community? So I just shared also a document called Lectures Topics. Uh, in terms of the, the work that we do at Truma Center around mental health and around addiction, uh, these are sort of uh, workshops that sort of we have offered and keep teaching all around. And now with Zoom, we can teach all around the country. So that's sort of like, again, in your chat, and I, I can send it to Gary as well. So if anybody's interested for us to sort of work together and trying how to support, that's, that's really great. The second one, I was really, Rabbi Smolking, uh, uh, you know, uh, reminded me in one of the things we talk about prayer meditation, like one of the things that have stayed with me uh, since I was a kid is saying the Shema on bedtime, which is really about sort of like, uh, uh, dealing with fears and support. And I, I highly recommend that sort of like, you know, just to bring a little bit of sort of like a Yiddish guy spirituality back to thing. Um, and then lastly, um, I would love to sort of to read the prayer together uh, as we close, but we can do that right at the end if you want, or I can do it now that whatever you want, Gary. Um, I only have two uh, things to say. So uh, if you want to do it now, that's fine. Sure. You want to do it now? All right. So this is the prayer. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, so this is a prayer that we wrote, I wrote on March 13th for things, a prayer for health and strength. Master of the universe, spirit of our world, we turn to you from our isolation and our fear. We feel heavy with sadness, worry, and dread. Unable to find answers, we retreat with heartache, quarantines from our communities, our source of our strength. We turn to you to find our common ground. We talk to you to share our thoughts, worry, pain, and terror. We raise our eyes to you to find inspiration and enlarge our field of vision to see that we are all one so that we may all find strength in our com common experiences. So we may all find hope in our ingenuity and creativity so that we may all share our vulnerability and our strengths so that we may express our compassion, our love and our hearts. Rock of ages. Fulfill the prophecy to the champ to champion the lowly among the people, deliver the needy folk, and reduce those who wrong them. God of our understanding, please bestow your spirit on all the inhabitants of our land. Inspire our scientists who work tirelessly to find cure and solution for those who suffer. Give strength and stamina to our doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who put their lives at risk every day for the world's benefit and well-being. Grant courage, wisdom, and empathy to our leaders who we need to show us the way. Bless us, God, of all living things with longevity, health, joy, and compassion. May our will meet your endless grace. Amen. Amen. Very nice. Thank you so much, Rabbi. It was enjoyable doing this with you. Um, two things. Uh, our mental wellness uh, uh, committee it's going to start working on bringing rabbis and other clergy together to discuss uh, a training for generally rabbis and, and how to deliver to the synagogues some of these post-coronavirus uh, uh, mental issues that we think are going to develop. And, the, and next week, we're going to talk about the financial intersection, the intersection of 5G and post-coronavirus and what all that means. Um, I think it's a... a, a an exciting topic 
and will have a profound effect on our kids and our grandkids. Um, with that, thanks again, Alan Budman. Thanks again, Iggy and everyone else who joined. Uh, everyone's input and Gary Cates, uh, everyone's input was sensational. Alan, did you want to say anything? I want to thank you and Rabbi Iggy for presenting. It was a tremendous presentation. Thank you for all those who participated. For those of you who would like to make a presentation, please write to me at a budman, a b u d m a n at fjmc.org. The Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs is very proud to present this webinar and many others. Uh, you can go on our website, fjmc.org, and see what our schedule is. You'll see very many uh, interesting topics that you may like, may, may like, and we hope you'll join us again. I thank you all for participating. Thanks, Alan, for doing thank this. You. Thank you, Gary. Well done. Yashikov. Take care. And thank you, thank you Rabbi you Iggy. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Iggy. Thank, thank you. you very much. Good night, everybody.